Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our next panel, How Powerful Are Algorithms Really? with Carrie Carajalios, computer science professor at University Urbana-Champaign, Camille Francois, Columbia University, and moderated by Casey Newton, founder of Platformer News. All right. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, some heady subjects to discuss today. Uh, Love the title. How powerful are algorithms really? Uh, to get started, maybe just to make sure everyone uh, is on the same page. Carrie, what is an algorithm? Um, I guess at a, at a you know, simple level, you can argue that a recipe is an algorithm. You have step-by-step -step instructions for how to you know, start, what you need, um, and it guides you to the end point. Um, algorithms can get uh, a bit more complex. You've probably been hearing a lot about machine learning algorithms, deep learning. Um, that style of algorithm basically takes lots and lots of data called typically in a, in a training set, observes it, and, ba and has outcomes, and tries to basically match all of the observations it sees with past outcomes. Um, that can be fraught with some challenges, as you may have already in, like, encountered. For example, if you're trying to build a classifier that finds dogs, and you have a data set full of cats and giraffes, um, it will not find a dog. Um, and so we've been seeing some, um, some unintended consequences today um, due to data sets that are used for training that are skewed. Um, so I gave you kind of like two endpoints here, but hopefully that sort of um, helps you fill in the gaps. That, that's a great place to start. Um, I think one of the big concerns that we have about algorithms, and you, know, you just described there are lots of different kinds of algorithms, but particularly when it comes to social media algorithms, people worry about what they optimize for. What, what do we know that they optimize for, Camille? What, what do we think that they're, they're trying to achieve? Yeah, that's a really difficult question. And you know, mm -hmm. the first reason is like we're talking about many different types of algorithms. Some of them are easier, kind of the recipe model, to look at and to say, oh, well, this was designed for that. And then I have you know, a, a moderate amount of confidence that indeed it achieves what it is designed for. Now, if you take more complex types of algorithm, if you take complex machine learning processes, then you might still have an intention, right? Like, so as we were saying, you have, uh, you're asking uh, the, uh, the, the model, for instance, to recognize dogs. And so you're optimizing for finding dogs amongst, uh, you know, a larger crowd of animals. Um, and that's one thing, but in all reality, A, it might not always actually do that. B, it might be integrated in broader systems in which uh, it, is, you know, it is not exactly performing uh, that specific function. And C, um, you might also have algorithms and, and systems produce important outcomes that are not what you optimize them for, but that are a byproduct of the instructions that you gave it. And so I think it's tempting to say, well, it's very easy, an algorithm is that. If you put them on social media, they optimize for keeping users on the platform, and that's a very elegant narrative. I think in reality, we're talking about a wider set of systems that vary immensely in their complexity, uh, that have been integrated in many different parts of different products, and that, not, that don't necessarily achieve their objectives, and on top of this have a lot of, um, a lot of unintended consequences that, that have often little to do with what they're actually being trained for. Sure, but, but I mean the conventional wisdom about algorithms is yes, like what, if we're talking about TikTok, we're talking about Twitter, we're talking about Facebook, they're absolutely optimizing to get you to keep coming back. Other people might say that they're optimizing to keep you outraged, right? Like maybe not by the system's design, but as you say, by a byproduct, because they find that, well, the madder I am, the more I'm gonna keep posting on Facebook, right? So that's very much the conventional wisdom about algorithms. Is that a fair way of thinking about the sort of algorithmic landscape we have today? I think it was true at a moment in time on specific products. So for instance, there was definitely a moment in time at Google where people design a recommendation algorithm for videos with the intent to keep the viewer uh, on the platform. Now, you know, an algorithm isn't a magic crystal ball. You don't write down a little piece, you know, a little piece of paper like keep the user coming back. So like you use proxies to achieve that. But in reality, again, like this is integrated with a wider set of systems around it. 
and with other competing processes. So you also have a set of processes that are designed to remove and detect bad content. But yes, I think that we have this, we have this conception, we have this idea because at a moment in time, it was very true that some processes, notably recommendation algorithms, were designed with kind of, you know, brutal, brutal ambitions that didn't really take into account the, um, the consequences, yeah. Right. So I think something that we can generally agree on about algorithms is that they're very opaque and difficult to understand, sometimes even by the people who are making them. It's, it's also the case, though, that most people who are encountering algorithms don't generally even know that those algorithms exist. So, Carrie, you did some really interesting research that showed that as recently as a few years ago, people didn't understand that their Facebook feed was ranked. Yeah, um, that was work done in, um, started in 2012, um, done in 2013 and 2014. Um, and I think, I think this idea of algorithm awareness is, is key here because one, you know, oftentimes you go to Google and do a Google search um, and people don't often think about why the top search they see is there. Um, so we were exploring, you know, what people saw on their Facebook feeds. And in this event, you know, top rated doctors, people were like, why would anybody ever curate my feed? People thought that everything posted by their friends was on this feed. Um, and it was over 60% of people that, that didn't have any idea. And this was right before, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but the Facebook emotion contagion study came out that upset a lot of people. Um, and it's very possible that not only were they upset that they were seeing more negative or more positive posts, but compounded by the fact that they had no idea the algorithm was there at all. Many, many people also, for example, get upset when they realize that you know, recommendations they write on Yelp don't always show up. Um, there's lots of things that happen that, you know, behind the scenes, and you put a lot of work and labor into something, and your, your mental model of what should happen, you know, doesn't happen. And there's this, this idea of awareness, you know, is kind of pervasive, not just with algorithms, but like, how many of you have gone to those like street lights where you press the button, like for that light yeah. to change and give you the walk symbol? Um, you know, in some cases that works, in some cases it doesn't work. Um, one of the things we're really interested in right now is how you know, your literacy of algorithms in one space might translate to another, but awareness is key because when folks weren't aware that there was an algorithm on Facebook, it was actually harming their relationships. For example, one person didn't reply to somebody's comment about their grandmother dying, and they're like, how dare did my friend not reply that? They cut them off. Um, and somebody else hadn't seen another message, but when we showed it to them, they were like, I felt so bad, I really wanted to help them with that. And so, People's expectations, where they don't align with what align with what the algorithms do, they they did hurt relationships. I do think it's probably the case. Like I, I, my assumption is, if you ran a similar study today, you would find that many more people are aware that the Facebook feed is ranked, particularly because it's become such a big meme yeah. in conservative circles, right? Like the algorithm is preventing you from getting to the truth. Um, and I think that sort of brings me to the next question I want to ask. We're here at the disinformation conference. What role do we think that algorithms play in promoting disinformation? And do we think that they play maybe a, a central role in that, or are they more of a side player? Um, you know, I, I don't see the inside data. Um, it's proprietary at many of these companies. Um, one of the things that we do know, though, is looking at other like surveys, that people's perceptions of what exists in the world are very different from what is the case. So for example, people overestimate how many people have a college degree. Um, people overestimate how many people um, make you know, huge sums of money. People um, you know, overestimate how many people have guns. Um, based on what they see and what get, what's dominated on these sites, um, you know, this, this stuff proliferates. Um, to give an example, um, in, in another study that we did looking at visualizations, we took ambiguous visualizations and, and put biased titles on them um, from like a whole spectrum. Um, and we found that people like clicked more on the biased titles. Like when we tried to make, you know, titles that were only descriptive, nobody wanted to click on them. Um, and then when the visualizations in some cases, the titles match the visualizations. In some cases, we went to the extreme. The titles had nothing to do at all with the visualizations. Uh, we gave people a distractor task to forget what they were doing and then asked them what the visualization was about. They just remembered the biased title. Um, and when you scroll down these feeds, especially when it comes to news, 
most people just read the titles. Um, and so, you know, what you click there, you know, influences what you see next. And there's numerous cases on YouTube, for example, of people, and Zainab Dufekshi does a really nice job explaining this, of, you know, you start clicking on something and a few clicks later, you know, you're seeing, you know, information that's trying to convert you to join, you know, some organization. Right. I mean, so when we talk about disinformation, uh, you know, information that is intentionally put out there to advance political aims, it strikes me that it has many ways of reaching people that might not even need algorithmic promotion, right? Uh, Fox News, I would argue, runs a lot of disinformation campaigns. There are sort of no algorithms involved here. So, you know, from the standpoint of, of folks who, who have studied these things and investigated these things, do you think that algorithms are sort of um, uh, being made a scapegoat for maybe larger problems? Um, yes, yeah, so disinformation has existed. I mean, you could argue that Ben Franklin, you know, participated in disinformation. Wait, what did Ben Franklin do? Um, you know, he had his own news <laughs> You know what he did. Um, but, but, please spill the tea on Ben Franklin. <laughs> well, people would write with pseudonyms. You know, people would, you know, you know, discuss, you know, things that they wanted to be controversial. Um, and that, that none of that is new. Um, and this came up yesterday. The amplification of it, I think, is what, what concerns me the most. This idea that, yeah, misinformation is always going to exist. And I think, I believe somebody mentioned yesterday, you go to a cocktail party, you know, you hear something, you say something, just because you hear it in a small group of five people doesn't mean that a million people are going to hear it and possibly believe it. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that's, that, that we need to better understand is how this is amplified. Um, and we've been looking at, you know, biased content on Twitter. Um, and so there is the, you know, what happens with the algorithm, what people say, and the reach that it gets. And for example, work by others at Stanford has found that you know, the number of people that you think see something on Facebook is really more than four times as many um, people as you think actually see it. And so uh, understanding the, the reach that you get, I think is gonna be, is gonna be critical here. And if, if it's getting to people that are more susceptible. Um, one, one last point there, um, you know, people keep talking about influencers and how influencers, you know, can actually reach more people as well. Um, and there's been this shift in this narrative that maybe we should, instead of just looking look at influencers, look at people who might be the most gullible because maybe they're being targeted. And so targeting is the other big part, I think, that we need to address here um, because targeting people that are most vulnerable to certain types of information, especially because they're most vulnerable to it, is something that is easier to do today than you could have done you right. know, years ago. And we know that old people share fake news more than anyone else, and they have to be stopped. <laughs> that there are reports of that, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you brought up the, the sort of reach question, and I think th this is a, a lesson that I think that the media needs to learn. Like, this is a part that I want to play in this. My least favorite story to read is like, oh, well, there was, you know, a, there a, re you know, a really bad story on Facebook, and it went viral. It had like 300 likes. You know, it's like, okay, like, you know, maybe a thousand people saw that. I think we need to kind of dial back some of the way that we report on instances of misinformation. I mean, there's so many reporters now whose full-time job is to essentially just type, you know, bad terms into search boxes and see what comes up and say, well, I found six examples of this on TikTok. It doesn't seem like a really sophisticated way of understanding, like, disinformation or algorithms to me. Um, but as you say, you know, polarization uh, predated social media. Um, actually, I don't want to ask that question. Let's, let's talk about the work that you did on bug bounties. So you were a part of this uh, group that has an amazing name, the Algorithmic Justice League. Uh, what, what did it do? And yeah. I'll do that. Let me just backtrack, you know, thinking about both of your conversation. And let me give you an answer to your question, which is like, how much are algorithms responsible for the disinformation problem? Like, of course, they don't create disinformation. I've spent, you know, a lot of time in my career finding and exposing you know, Russian actors, Iranian actors, neo-Nazi groups, conspiracy groups. Like, of course, those are the creators of the disinformation. But algorithms are absolutely essential, critical, and key to how disinformation propagates on social media. It's the recommendation. Of course, we talked about that. It's the targeting. But it's also what underpins the entire content moderation infrastructure, which is what those disinformation actors are trying to gain. A lot of the content moderation relies on algorithms to go and flag the bad content mm -hmm. and find it and take it down. And so, you know, this entire 
um, playing field is an algorithmic playing field. And so we can't blame our algorithms for disinformation, but we also just really can't and should not take them out of the equation, right? Like it is absolutely completely the playing field upon which this unfolds. Again, both on the recommendation, on the targeting, on the content moderations, just gripe everywhere. Just real quick, I mean, it sounds to me like what you're saying is there's really practically very little way to separate algorithms from social networks in general, right? That like what you're talking about is the entire system. If you were to remove algorithms, you would still see things in reverse chronological order, which is just another sorting mechanism, right? So we want to separate algorithm from social network, but in reality, I mean, can you sort of argue they're one and the same? Well, they, they are an essential, they're an essential building block of how those social network are built, right? Because like right now you're talking about the specific algorithm that dictates how content shows up in a feed. That's one out of many algorithms that are very relevant to the spread of disinformation. Even if you remove that, you still have many algorithms that come into ads targeting. That's very relevant to disinformation. Again, you still have all the content moderation algorithms that people don't see. And so, you know, at the end of the day, social networks are absolutely made on gigantic, enormous towers of complicated algorithms integrated into one another. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of bias often that gets baked into these algorithms. Talk, talk about some of the work that you did uh, on these bug bounties. Absolutely. So with the Algorithmic Justice League, we looked at um, a practice that comes from the cybersecurity world called a bug bounty program. And uh, traditionally in cybersecurity, a bug bounty program is when you invite independent hackers to go and kind of poke holes at your system and tell you, um, you know, if, and you tell them like, if you find a bug, I will pay you money for it. Um, it's been, it's been a system that's worked fairly well in cybersecurity. Uh, all of the major platforms, including social media platforms, run bug bounties. And we looked at this and we thought, could we apply them to flawed algorithms? The same way you kind of invite people to poke around and say, hey, you have a bug here. Can you invite people to poke around and say, that algorithm is flawed? And actually, when you look a little bit closer, what you realize is, people are already doing this on social media. There have been many movements of social media users who kind of come together and say, hey, when I upload a picture of me on Twitter, it kind of crops weird. Does it crop weird for you? Can you please share the same thing for you? Can we just like collect a few things together and see if we have like a big problem here? And so there have been a few movements like that. Um, and so we propose to take some of these bug bounty mechanisms adapted, of course, because at the end of the day, a cybersecurity bug is not exactly like a, like a you know, unfair algorithm, and to use this to help, um, to help really encourage this crowdsourced public movements of people transparently exposing these types of harms and hopefully getting compensation for the work that they put in in exposing these types of problems. Right, and Twitter wound up going ahead and running one of these bug bounties on the photo cropping um, uh, issue. And, and say a little bit about what they found. It was really interesting. So that photo cropping issue, you know, if you look at the timeline, like users had already done this movement online on their own social network saying, this is really broken. We think that there's a bias problem. Um, Twitter had already looked into it and written a research paper about it, which is quite remarkable, right? Like you have a platform whose product is being uh, criticized publicly. They're like, okay, let us look into it. We'll write a paper, that was great. Then they decommissioned the algorithm and it also turned out that that algorithm was open source. And so they kind of had all the elements to take the next step and say, well, if we're no longer using it, if we already got a PR problem for it, if we already researched it, if it's no longer a core to our product, why don't we just invite people at DEF CON, big cybersecurity conference, to go and poke around with it, and then you know we will pay the best contributions who show the problems that we had. And of course, they had multiple teams uh, do very creative analysis on how unfair, broken, and biased that system was. Yeah, if you could like do another bug bounty on another social network, like what would you do? So it's interesting because the, one of the main reasons why this worked is also because people were able to play with the algorithm, right? It was open source. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I'm interested in is when the bug bounty movement started, there was this idea of an adversarial bug bounty, not one product saying, I will invite you and I will pay you for you to tell me about my product, but organizations saying, well, 
go and poke at other people's product and we will pay you if you find something that's in the public interest and we will support you and protect you in publishing it. And I think that unfortunately, for many of these algorithmic harms, we might be better suited with these adversarial models because the companies themselves are not necessarily in a position to say, hey, come and poke around in my own infrastructure and I will reward you for it. So I think it's the right mm -hmm. moment to kind of bring back these adversarial models. Sure, I, I mean, I, I, but I, I still wanna know, like what's an example? Say you have one of these adversarial groups and they get together, they're like well-funded, like what should they be going after to help us better understand how these algorithms work? But again, it's like pick your, you know, pick, a, pick what's interesting to you. Like what I thought totally fascinating recently is during the pandemic, uh, loads of students ended up staying at home, taking exams remotely, and so there was a proliferation of remote proctoring systems. Remote proctoring system you put on your camera and they kind of like watch you to make sure you're not cheating or I don't really know what they think they're doing. And everybody knows it's a terrible idea because it runs on facial analysis algorithms which we know are biased, which we know perform less well on specific skin types. And this led to a movement of students and professors saying like, hey, we want to go and hack that stuff. We want to prove that it's racist. We want to prove that it's biased. We want to prove that we shouldn't be taking our exams in front of those broken systems. And so here you have sort of this perfect pair between there's a use case, there's a bunch of student hackers encouraged by their professors, and they go after it because they care and because, you know, they're actually meaningfully able to articulate this is the harm that we are um, facing as a result of the systems. Yeah. So the cool thing about bug bounties is people, long story short, people end up poking at what they care about. Right, uh, that is super interesting and they should run that one. Um, let's bring it back to you know, uh, social media a bit, uh, talk about filter bubbles. This is a subject that you've done some work on, Carrie. Um, you know, one of the big concerns is uh, you know, on Facebook, I'm gradually gonna block everyone who disagrees with me. I'm only gonna see news stories from you know, my ideological point of view, um, and that's bad. Facebook would say, well, actually, we've done the research and it shows that you're probably exposed to more views on Facebook than you'd be exposed to in your everyday life because you typically have a, a big and more diverse friend network. So what, what sort of research have you done on the subject and how do you think about it? Um, so we've done like, We've looked at varied spaces. One space in particular looked at, um, you know, delineating different uh, stances. For example, uh, many of you might recall the red feed, blue feed that was put out, I believe, by the Wall Street Journal a while ago. Um, you know, this is where they sort of tried to show you like what you would see if you were sort of very partisan uh, in, in your Facebook feed. Yeah, and so they separated into two side-by-side -side views. Um, you know, one of the things that we found is that by having comparisons, like almost like counterfactuals, people can start making assumptions about what algorithms are doing. Um, we found that having these um, stances actually didn't help very much. We found that it actually increased polarization. Um, this idea that if you, you know, if you see something that you disagree with, um, you get sometimes even angrier than you were before. Um, also, it, it, a lot of this depended on your political orientation coming in and certain other factors. Um, we also found that by having these types of stances legitimized some content that maybe should not have been you know, as legitimate. Um, other things that we've looked at have included just label it, labeling things as not being factual. Um, it turns out that wasn't very helpful at all. Sometimes those are the funnest things to read and sometimes that label of it not being factual may make it more attractive to you. Um, and then maybe it's hard to, to remember, you know, that title that you read, um, if it was real or accurate, but you remember the title. Um, and so this, this idea of, it, this has come again and again in the work, this idea of, uh, we, we explored it also, for example, in, um, in, camp, in crowdfunding campaigns. Um, let's say somebody is, you know, putting up a crowd campaign to fund, you know, their lesbian wedding, um, and somebody doesn't agree with that, um, they're, they become even more angrier and they don't fund at all. Um, whereas if somebody sees the opposite point of view um, and they, they see a campaign they don't agree with, um, in some cases people who were liberal were more likely to become more open-minded um, and actually pay money for, uh, to support a, a viewpoint they didn't agree with. Um, but again, it depends on so many different factors. Sure. Um, I mean, f fair to say, though, that 
algorithms are creating filter bubbles? Or in any social network where people are posting political views, are you just going to kind of encounter a range of views that might affect you in various ways? So I think the whole platform here, like there's a, a huge infrastructure and algorithms like uh, Camille was saying play a role. Um, you know, people's behaviors, you know, play a role that then become amplified. And so they provide a space where it's just so much easier to only see something that you want. Um, and it's also really hard for us to understand what this, what this diet should be. Um, you know, when President Obama spoke yesterday, he mentioned the study that was done um, it was like a five-year-long study where they showed, you know, they, they paid Fox viewers to watch other forms of news. Um, and when they did, you know, some of their viewpoints changed. Um, this reminded me a bit of some, like, early work with, you know, radio stations where, you know, even if you played songs that people didn't like, you played them more often, they started to like them. Um, and, you know, I don't even know what's going on at some of these streaming services today with respect to music. but. We do know that the more you see a specific type of content, the more it influences you. Yeah, I, I just I have trouble seeing a way around you know putting ranking into into social networks. Like if we're going to have social networks at all, it feels like there's going to be feed. Actually, so let's let's talk about the flip side of it. You know, in any discussion of algorithms, we almost entirely fixate on the worst things that ever be, come mm -hmm. from algorithms. Um, it also strikes me that algorithms have arguably played an important role in the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. I think support for Ukraine right now is probably through the roof, right, in large part due to the algorithmic promotion of viral clips of Zelensky, right? Uh, wh why do you think that all of that gets left out of the discussion of the power of algorithms? So, you know, Zeynep Tufekci has written a lot about this, about how they have helped, you know, mobilize people. Um, Oftentimes, when you start seeing something working really well, it also attracts others. Um, you know, the, the Obama campaign in 2012, you know, used these algorithms to their advantage. Um, and then people kept, you know, building off of that and doing other things. Um, there's been lots of work on algorithms helping with disaster relief and humanitarian movements. And then later, you find out that some of these posts, um, if you look at the geotag, weren't actually where people said they were. And so you see, start seeing some you know, nefarious, um, you know, nefarious content, you know, filtering into the, the big ecosystem. Um, and so they do help, they've helped a lot. I mean, taking it out of social media for a second, you know, algorithms have been amazing in improving speech recognition um, that have helped, you know, many people with disabilities. Um, you know, that, what's different about that example though, is it's easy to quantify, there's a gold standard. You know that the speech recognition, you know what the, answer is supposed to be, and you can compare it to what the algorithm popped out. Um, when it comes time to social media and you see, you know, a setting that says, show me more posts like this, or, you know, hide posts like this, um, it's like something like this might be different to me than it is to Camille. Um, and so what the gold standard is becomes a challenge. Um, but that said, they, they do help mobilize people. Um, and to the extent that you have these trusted networks, you know, that can be extremely, extremely empowering. Yeah, I just, I think it's an important point to bring up because I think when you're talking about disinformation algorithms, there's always a risk that what you're really saying is like, well, a lot of information that I don't like seems to be very popular, right? Um, you know, which is, which is true, and like, I, I, I also hate the information that I hate that is popular, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to pin it all on an algorithm, again, it, it sort of feels like scapegoating to me. Camille, how do you feel about it? I feel we're at a weird moment, if I'm gonna be honest. I think like, if you think about how we conceived of the relationship between internet and democracy, social network and protest, um, you know, at first, there was of course this idea that, um, social networks were going to magically bring democracy everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that was a very popular idea. That was, of course, you know, even a, a diplomatic uh, endeavor. Um, and that was a great moment of the Arab Spring. And I think we saw the pendulum swing from this, from actually authoritarian governments are also able to respond to those social networks. They are able to respond with censorship for the first time and then they're able to respond by not only just removing the things that they don't like, but flooding the zone with their own perspectives and propaganda. And I think that you know what's probably starting now is us putting this pendulum back in the middle, right? Like 
social networks are not going to magically bring democracy. They're also not the big evil uh, carrier of propaganda, right? That was a very 2016 idea where everybody had to deal with a difficult reckoning over the fact that nobody saw the 2016 uh, Russian interference campaign arrive, which is, you know, very odd. I think that now we're kind of settling and, and what's happening in Ukraine is, is really telling with, well, it's neither nor, of course, and it's, it's interesting and difficult to shape how we want to structure not just social media, not just algorithms, but regulations, sanctions, content moderation in order to bring about the potential that social media can bring to democracy. And, you know, maybe that's a good synthesis moment that we're entering. Um, so I don't think that it's all bad. Yeah. And I never thought it was all good either. But maybe right now we're going to finally discuss where all the levers are and how they should be set. I, a, amen to mm -hmm. that. I think that's the, absolutely the right move. Uh, you, you brought up regulation. There's a lot of ideas about how we ought to regulate social media in general. Uh, I think there's a bill floating around the House right now that would uh, remove Section 230 protections for content that is promoted algorithmically which it's like, if you're looking for, you know, people who think that algorithms are a boogeyman, I mean, like, this is sort of the embodiment of that. Um, but, you know, like, as a computer scientist, I'm curious, like, how do you think about uh, a bill that, you know, wants to tackle the algorithm issue in that way? Well, one, I think it's very, very hard. Um, you know, you talk to people in so many, so many areas around this, like from lawyers to computer scientists, to people on the hill, um, and people like can't see what it should be. Like one example that I, you know, like to give is like Wikipedia. Like we know that people like to embrace Wikipedia because they knew what an encyclopedia was like. So it was easy for them to, you know, create something, um, and they had a target goal. Like we don't even know what we want. Um, so when we don't know what we want, it's hard. It's really hard for us to design it. Um, like there's some cases of, of regulation that might be easier, and at the moment I think it has to be in a case by case basis. Um, you know, one example of an algorithm, you know, sort of like unchecked by humans running amok, um, like an Amazon. I, I think of Amazon as social media because it, you know, provides media. There's lots of people on it. They discuss. There's there's markets. Um, but there's like a book. I think it was about flies. There's two different you know institutions selling this book. Um, and there was some algorithm, I guess, that they were like comparing the prices amongst them. And within a short amount of time, this book was over a million dollars. Um, you know, that might be an easy case to see, well, you know, if something changes this rapidly and it, it's above a certain threshold that's unrealistic for a book, um, then, you know, let's, let's stop it, let's flag it. Um, regulation for other things, like, so it's, it's easier for us to address this in cases where we can see the harms. Um, if I can just step out of this for a second and discuss another algorithmic system used in the state of Michigan. Um, there was a system that was used to flag people that were, um, you know, participating in employment fraud. Um, and it wasn't a smart system at all. You know, my guess is it had a bunch of if statements, like if you were fired, if you got laid off, then this. Um, and basically, um, prior to the use of the system, maybe like there was human error in the outcomes, like maybe 40%, but with the system, it was like over 90%. Um, were errors. Were errors, yeah. Um, the challenge is here, with the, when these algorithms like affect your life, um, you know, people have bad credit, they can't get loans in their houses now, many of them are still in courts trying to, you know, get their lives back, and many of them are still having their pay taken from them via their uh, tax returns, and, and they have no, contestability for it. And so I think contestability here is something that is key and we haven't discussed too much. But, you know, one step is to build contestability into these systems um, where I can, you know, have some course of action. And in many cases, it involves a person. Um, so we've done a lot of work looking at these forms of contestability and it's hard. You know, I, I'm like the most boring person at dinner parties because I keep asking everyone if they've ever managed to contest their credit score. Um, <laughs> and I have like yet to find somebody that is, well, one person like was able to change their, did I see a hand go up? Did, She's has, gonna need about an hour with you after. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, one person was able to fix their identity, which was wrong. Um, but 
you know, these things were hard to contest to begin with, and it's really hard to even get at a human or, or, or track where the problem was. I, I mean, you're also bringing up something I think is important, which is I think algorithm, algorithms are causing all sorts of harms everywhere. Um, and the ones that I really appreciate you bringing up here are ones that almost never get any, any discussion. And, and, I do, and again, I'm not trying to like wash my hands of mm -hmm. algorithms on social media. I think they're very powerful there as well. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like the conversation has gotten very far away from the facts there, whereas stuff like you know, this kind of discrimination just really gets relatively little discussion. I think it's because people know that there are algorithms on social media. We tell them every day, all day, it's always the headlines. And I think that what's really interesting in the stories you're sharing is there are many cases in which people don't realize they're facing algorithms in their day-to-day, -day, right? If you take a normal person, you ask them to go about their day and ask them, how many times today have you encountered an algorithmic decision? They're not able to answer that. And sometimes it doesn't matter at all, right? So we were chatting about elevator banks. If you have a big elevator banks, there's a really smart set of algorithms that optimize where the elevators are gonna rest in order to make everything go faster. That's great. What's the impact on society? Very little. Should we worry? Probably not. If anything, I want more of these. If you've ever been waiting for an elevator for more than a minute, come on. Right. But if you apply for a loan, do you know if your application is reviewed by an algorithm? And if your application is reviewed by an algorithm, do you know what is the weight of that score in the final decision process? These are where it really matters, and those are not answers that people have, right? Like in the normal course of their day to day, on those decisions, small and big, from you know loan application to criminal sentencing, there's really a need to bring transparency in when algorithms are used and how they're used. Yeah, and uh, probably in some of these decisions, they just should not be used at all. Right. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm going to have two more questions, and then we're going to have time for audience mm -hmm. questions. So please, if you have questions, we would love to hear from you. Um, one of my pet peeves about social networks is how little information they make available to researchers. I wish that you had uh, tremendous mm -hmm. access to these systems, could understand them in real time. So I want to sort of put it to you. Um, what would you like to know about a Facebook or a TikTok or a Twitter type algorithm that you don't know? What, what would you study if you could? Oh my God, that's <laughs> like, a, what a wonderful question. Um, and to have that power. Um, you know, a lot of what, like, I've been really interested in housing, you know, in face-to-face -face settings and in online. Um, it's been so hard, and, and we find housing discrimination on Facebook with advertisements. So, for example, if you're black, you're more likely to get loans for predatory ads than if you're white. Um, you know, and there's been this amazing group at NYU who was collecting ad data, and um, they were stopped from, from collecting it. Um, first, it was to protect the privacy, <coughs> supposedly, of, of people that got debunked. But, um, you know, in our work with advertisements, I would love, like, I spend 90% of my time trying to collect the data that I need. So if I could get a reliable source of data around advertisements that people see to understand a discrimination there, that would be amazing. Um, another <coughs> example where, um, you know, I would love to see reliable data is around, um, you know, how, how much of what I see is dependent on what I click versus what is pushed to me uh, because somebody pays for me to see it. Mm. Um, I would really also just want to know how much people pay for the content. Mm. Like, I think that should be visible. That should be transparent. Uh, if I'm seeing something because somebody paid, you know, a lot of money for it. Right. Um, you know, we were able to look at some, um, some inside data because something hadn't been covered up yet. For example, if I'm on a site, um, there's a bidding war for ads. And so we were able to see sort of like the three ads that you might have been shown and then the one that you were shown. Um, and so that was interesting um, when we talked to people. The one that they were shown was the ad that probably was the release related to them. Um, but I think, I think that for me right now, I'm really interested in information about um, who pays for what and why. Um, it's so hard to tell what is sponsored content and what is not sometimes. Um, I would love for these researchers and us to be able to see all of this ad data. And I also would really like to see um, more partnerships. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Social Science Research Council, but they worked with you know, um, Harvard University and other entities to try to create um, data sets um, to help people. 
And so I think some of these partnerships could be really helpful. And we're going we're gonna to have missteps, and we're going to make mistakes along the way. Um, there was a mistake with one of the data sets that was released. Um, but hopefully, you know, we shouldn't take these mistakes as, you know, we stop doing this. Um, we should, you know, we always make, like we're learning to walk, we fall. You know, we will find a way to, um, to hopefully create some of these data sets, but we need more of these partnerships. But we also need to make them such that this data is available to a wide range of researcher, researchers, not just the elites. Yeah. Uh, Camille, do you have an answer to that question? Yes. What, what is it? Mm -hmm. It's my wish list, so you've got to make it happen. Yeah. Um, I want the map of how those decisions get made at the systemic level for mm. these companies. Right, because at the end of the day, like content moderation is so complicated. You have different branches, different team, different types of classifiers, different types of partnerships. If you take Facebook, for instance, you have a group called Dangerous Actors. They have a list of those dangerous actors. They have detection models for where are those guys on the platform. And then you have behavioral implementation. Then you have spam. Then you have content moderation. Then you have different team of content moderators. And like every time we think about these issues, we end up talking about like one of these systems. And it's we know they exist, but it's so hard to do the entire map of like, okay, what is the full organization of that house at Facebook and elsewhere, right? Like, where are the classifiers? Where are the moderators? Where are the programs that we don't know about? Like cross-check, you know, like those users, they're exempt from this. And just my wish list is someone give me the big map, like we'll make it a poster, you know, it'll be really fun to look at. Um, and then we'll understand like, again, how many teams, how many rules, how many classifiers, how many external partnerships, how many programs that do exceptions here and there. It's extraordinarily complicated, but it would give us a sense of the machines that we're trying to understand, live with, and regulate. If you work mm -hmm. at a platform and can smuggle any of this data out, please DM <laughs> me for my signal. We'd love to work on something together. Okay, who's got a question? Right here. Actually. There are people with mics uh, that will mm -hmm. come to you. Yeah. Oh, I meant him, but, but. <laughs> sorry, we'll get you next. Okay. Oh, um, so related to that question, do you think that um, transparency about the algorithm and access to the data should be uh, that Section 230 protection should be dependent upon providing that access. Should, should platforms face legal liability mm -hmm. if they don't show us what's in their algorithms? It's a very difficult question yeah. because we don't really know what it means to show us what's in their algorithm. I will cite one paper because I think it's fantastic, but my colleague Evelyn Dweck just wrote a paper called Content Moderation as Administration. It is not an easy read, it is, it is big. But it talks about how so far we've thought about content moderation and algorithms as like almost legal processes and kind of ignored the broader context and set of decisions, including political decisions around it. And if we change our paradigm for how we try to understand and regulate them, we might be equipped to ask these types of questions, which is these are the transparency that we want uh, in order to allow you to um, operate. Yeah, if I could add to that just very briefly. Yep. Um, you know, I, I also think that access, um, having access, it should be commensurate to the harms that are caused by some of these algorithms. Mm -hmm. And so that's a different framing mm -hmm. around that, but I do think we need to start thinking about the consequences and, and access based on the, the magnitude of the harms. So we're good with the elevators. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right here with the red lanyard. Lanyard, Casey, really? Lanyard, isn't that what we call them? Everybody has a lanyard. Oh, that's right, sorry. <laughs> it's a bad <laughs> algorithm. No, it's a green lanyard, black, anyway. Um, so, thank you for uh, picking on me here. Um, picking up on the theme of access relative to harm, at what point does it become just like corporate negligence? Using a specific example, uh, Facebook groups is a pretty influential part of that platform. While I'm glad that people can find, you know, others to go on a bike ride with, I think that's important. I am concerned about the clan using it to find one another to, you know, host an insurrection. Right. Right. So how do we think about like recommender systems for groups? Sorry. You know, that, um, you know, that gets super, super complicated. Like I'm, this is going to date me how old I am. Like I was using Usenet um, really big in the 80s, um, lots of different groups um, decentralized. Um, then like Yahoo groups came out and 
you know, I was on a group like supporting, um, you know, women refugees, and that group was like banned. Um, From Yahoo? Yeah, like they, they forced to close down. Um, and so, you know, on Facebook right now, you have lots of private groups. Um, and, you know, we've been trying to study some of them. It's very hard to study certain private groups, for, both for ethical reasons, but also because it's hard to, um, to, to get in. But, you know, I, I really do think we need some regulation around it. And this is where I really wish I was a lawyer. Um, and so I like, beg all of the lawyers in the room to help us with this. Um, but, you know, there are rules, like this came up earlier, like banning naked photos online. You know, this is seriously affecting, you know, artists today. Um, there are rules um, banning dead people online. And this, this became critical, you know, with many, many of us pushing to show some of these images of, of migrants that were harmed. Um, but I do think in some of these cases, um, if we interrogate them deeply, we can start seeing patterns for what should we at least have humans look at um, and then make decisions about. The, the thing I would add is, uh, you know, once a group uh, grows to a certain size, these platforms just need to have a check that say, what is this group, right? Make sure it uh, is, is adhering to their policies. They need to catch the bad groups much quicker than they have historically. Yeah. If I could yeah. just add one more thing to that. Um, Sorry. Four minutes for questions. Oh my gosh. So we, we've been studying these rules on Reddit and people's alignment of rules with the moderators. And it's fascinating to see exactly what you said, like how when the group gets too large, how the group, the rules stop working. Yep, there you go. All right. saying, Casey, is, if we had my map, we would also see the other things that's that right. come we into this. We need to get that map. Yeah. There's a question back here. Yes. Um, By the way, the microphone doesn't work. Why are we handing people the broken microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it works for the broadcast. Maybe it works the there. Archive. Yeah. All right, we can hear you. You can just ask your question. All right, I can just speak louder. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm really curious about something. I heard all of you talk about um, how um, many times in our everyday life, we don't know that we're being addressed by an algorithm. That's a kind of invisibility. And so I want to go a little bit deeper down than that, because if that's invisible, then certainly the training sets that are teaching the algorithms are even more invisible. I've been researching this um, for, I don't know, three or four years, I'm not seeing very much about that. And I'm really concerned about it because I'd like to know how or if there's anything um, that's happening with regard to preventing implicit vi bias in that context. That, that's a yeah. great question. So you know, if you couldn't hear it, the question was basically, um, uh, all machine learning systems are built on training sets, but what, what do we actually know about the training sets and is anybody doing work to ensure that the training sets are, are big and diverse? What can you tell us about that? I'll take the lazy answer here and say that this is one of the reasons why I believe it's important to empower hackers, to empower researchers, and to protect them in going poking around. Yeah. We were just talking about these um, proctoring systems. And I was sharing to you that, you know, people started saying like, that's not okay, we're gonna go poke around. One of these students who wanted to look into this actually uh, reversed engineered one of those most, um, most popular um, systems and found that it was actually using a widely used facial recognition training library that was very, um, just unfit for this type of use and that had been documented as, as, as being dysfunctional. And that work is really important because it not only puts the context around this is why you shouldn't be using that system, but it helps this person publish and document these are the underlying reasons why you see these biases and why you see these harms, which is again why I personally think that we need to empower people to find it and then to publish it. Because when you find the underlying cause in one system, you really help the rest of the industry say, and that, is why you shouldn't be using this system, or at least for that use. Right. All right, we have one minute left. Has anybody got a short question? Uh, right here? So you work, would it work without mics? Yes, that's great. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, the idea, the algorithm is such a broad idea, including the elevator graph. The real thing is, nowadays we are all cyborgs. We're humans that were in, in, enabled in part by artificial intelligence and things. So the real problem is transparency. Trying to legislate uh, uh, 
using algorithms in, in Section 30, I think, is, is a dead end because what is an algorithm? What we really need is some kind of transparency that is feasible politically to be implemented. So therefore, I very much like Harry's idea that when somebody's paying to show you something, you should see how much they're paying. Yeah. That's something that you could probably get non-legislatively that would really help. There you go. Uh, ten seconds left. What, what's what's something else that you'd like to see more transparency on? You know, maybe mandated. You have a thought there? Um, you know, I would like it. You know, I think I'm in alignment with Camille. Um, is I would like it to be easier to run these audits. Um, you know, like you, we've seen that people um, collectively come together. So this it's created the city of this collective audit where people might share their data. Um, and by being able to audit and interrogate some of these systems, um, I think it, it sort of like lifts the lid, the lid on it a little bit and actually has us speaking out. I think we need more people in the public to speak out. I think that we need to be able to have these algorithmic audits to be able to create more movements around them so that we can you know, get the systems that we need. Um, and the idea of transparency is a really, is a really, really hard one. Um, because sometimes when we want to reveal something to people, they don't want to see all 700 feature features or more behind the Facebook algorithm, but they want to see what they need to do to control their lives, um, not to control you know, the computer. Um, and so that's one of the big research challenges is how do we, feel, how do we, dis how do we discover what we, sh what we should reveal? All right, well, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>